I also am going to depart from some of the remarks that I have prepared uh, because I want to respond to some things that came up today and, 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 and tell uh, at least one story that I think will um, maybe motivate you uh, to think about things in a new way. Um, I really disagree with the person who asserted that um, generally nonprofit agencies are well managed and should be, provide a model for anything. Uh, in my experience, most nonprofit agencies are horribly managed and, um, and, expect to, uh, and expect their staff to be held accountable for nothing. Um, and, and, and the matter of fact is that this is reflected in all of the efforts to evaluate whether they're accomplishing anything. If you want to know uh, whether the nonprofit sector is effective, you should know that the vast majority of all efforts to evaluate nonprofit programming, especially in human services, show that they don't produce any outcomes. So I don't want uh, this to be a self-congratulatory experience. I want this to be a sobering experience in which you ask yourself, are we really uh, delivering social value and do we deserve to have the money that we are asking people to invest in us? Um, having said that, I will also say that the management guru, Jim Collins, did point out that it is infinitely harder to manage a nonprofit well than it is to manage a, a for-profit corporation well, precisely for some of the reasons that other speakers have talked about, because the indicators that you're doing well are much more complex uh, to, to manage toward. So um, from my point of view, nonprofits in general are very badly managed, if they're managed at all. And um, there are a lot of reasons for it, not that their leaders are bad people, it's that they're often their leaders are woefully unprepared, and those even who are prepared are being pulled in 17,000 different directions by stupid funders who are making unreasonable demands on them, at having high transaction costs for getting money, and expecting them to address what, they, what the funders think is important rather than the reason why the nonprofit is in business in the first place. So it's not that I don't have empathy for nonprofit leaders, it's just I want to say that at, in general, they're not doing a very good job. That's my point of view. So let me, let me tell you a true story. Um, this was researched by a, a, a physician researcher at Massachusetts General Hospital by the name of Atul Gawande. Uh, who is extraordinary in the area of performance management in medicine. You all may have heard of an, of an illness called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, you're born with it, you either have it or you don't have it. If you're born with it and nobody does anything, you tend to die by the age of seven because your lungs fill up with mucus and you drown. It's a horrible illness. There are 124 centers in America that treat or that provide services for uh, cystic fibrosis. In 117 of those centers, if you go to them, you will not live until you're seven, you'll live on average until you're about um, 33. So the difference between seven and 33 is what, 26 years? So that's an outcome. That is a real outcome, and it's a good outcome, and it's a significant outcome, until you know that in the other seven centers where you can get treatment for cystic fibrosis in America, you don't live until you're 33, you live until you're 50. Now, that hasn't changed in over 10 years. It's the same places where you live to 50, and the other 117 where you live to be to about 33. Hasn't changed. So you say, well, are they doing different things? Nope. All 124 are doing the same four things. They're all giving people enzyme treatments to help break up the mucus in the lungs. They're all giving people high calorie diets to fight the infection that produces the mucus. They're all giving people inhalers to, um, to uh, use airway as a passage for um, medicine that breaks up the mucus. And they're all giving people vests that are motorized uh, that shake you to break free the mucus, or putting 14 points on your body where people will hit you with an open hand um, many times a day to break up the mucus in your lungs so you cough it out and so that you keep um, um, to a minimum the accumulation of mucus in your lungs. All, 120, all 124 clinics in America treating cystic fibrosis do the same four things. 
At 117, you live to age 33. At seven, you live until you're 50. I really want that to sink in. They all do the same things. Their program is the same program. Their model is the same model. Their metrics are the same metrics. They all measure one thing. They measure one long-term outcome, which is yes or no to death. It's an easy measurement. And the other, the other metric is, what is your lung capacity on any given day? And the idea being that you should try to keep lung capacity as large as possible. That's it. So now, if they're measuring the same thing, and they're doing the same thing, how can it be that at seven of these places, you have an outcome that's 17 years better than the outcome at the other 117? I will start to unpack this for you by mentioning the fact that the leaders of the seven clinics where you live to be 50 years old, all studied pulmonary medicine with the same professor. It's interesting. And this professor taught them cystic fibrosis is not a genetic disease, although it is. Cystic fibrosis is a degenerative disease. Once you redefine cystic fibrosis as a degenerative disease, you can start asking yourself, what can we do to slow down the degeneration? And forget about the fact that it's genetic. And here is where the difference comes out. Where you are going into the 117 places where you live to age 33, you go in every week, they measure your lungs, and if they notice that you've lost 2%, the doctor will say, David, you've lost 2%. That's not good. Let's keep an eye on it. And then if you go back a week later and you lost two more percent, the doctor will say, David, you're trending in the wrong direction. That's not good. Let's review. Let me empower you. Let's review what we have taught you, how to manage this. Are you taking your medication? Let's review your medication taking. Are you following the diet? Let's review that. Are you using your inhaler? Let's review that. Are people smashing you on the body? Or are you wearing your vest and are you coughing it out, right? Let me empower you. Let me teach you how to do it because you're a customer. I don't believe in customers of human services. Um, I believe in empowering people, but I don't believe in treating them as customers. Why? Because if you buy a lemon of a car, whose fault is it? It's your fault. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. That's the motto of business that has customers. The motto of human service providers who have patients or clients is do no harm. There's a big difference. And so I don't want to see human services have customers. I want to see them have clients that are empowered as much as possible. Big difference. So now you've gone another week and you've lost another 2 to 3%. Then the doctor says, David, if this keeps up, we're going to have to put you in the hospital, put you in an inhalation tent give you IV drugs, um, force feed you a high calorie diet, and get six strong men to pound on you every day to get you to cough it out. And, uh, we'll, you know, and we'll try to get you back to where you were. And of course, eventually that's what happens, but you never got back to where you were. You get back to it, you've, you've lost permanently one or two percent. And if that repeats itself, you die at age 30. In the seven places where you live to be 50, what happens is you walk into your doctor's office, you've lost 1% of lung capacity in the past week. The doctor doesn't say, that's not a good idea, let's keep an eye on it. The doctor doesn't say, let's review what you're doing. The doctor gets up from behind her desk, she walks over to you, she looks you in the eye. If you're a kid, she gets down at eye level and she says, David, we, not you, we have a life crisis on our hands. Right now, take off your shirt, bend over, pow, 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 cough, David, cough, pow, 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 cough, David, cough, pow, pow, pow. Let's get you back to zero loss right now. And they do. And they do. So that is what the performance management is. Managing performance comes about when you have leaders 
who've defined the problem correctly, when you have leaders who are absolutely not going to tolerate bad performance, when you have leaders who teach their staff that failure is not an option, even though inevitably it happens, when you have leaders that take constant corrective measures, including staff investing in st professional staff development, including teaching people how to respond immediately to incremental changes, either good changes or bad changes, and to, who, and to have leaders who inculcate a culture in the organization that says, we're not going to let the bad things happen if, they're, if, if it's negative outcomes, or we are going to make damn sure the good things happen if it's positive outcomes. So now um, going to my uh, slides. I don't know how to do this. Let's see. Ah, it worked. Let me just re re recapture what other people have said. Basically, America has, has become a third world country. Um, we, have, um, uh, we have a middle class that is dying out. Um, wealth is being transferred to the top 1% of the country. And escape from the lowest um, socioeconomic strata into the middle class not only has declined, but the middle class is sinking into the lowest socioeconomic strata. So you have an evaporating middle class. This is no news. But what it means for the nonprofit sector is the following. First of all, people who never would have needed services before will need services. So demand for your services is going up. Many of the people who donated to you no longer can afford to donate. And government is going broke, so it can no longer afford to spend what it, what it has spent in the past to, to support nonprofit programs. So demand is going up, and sources of resources are going down. Foundation portfolios are shrinking. Therefore, the amount of grants many of them are making are going, are, are going down, too. The number and amount, the dollar amount. So in essence, the situation for the nonprofit sector is looking very much like the socioeconomic situation for the whole country. At the bottom level, you will have nonprofits that are small, that are all volunteer, that are working out of church basements, that are spending practically no money, don't therefore need a lot of money to survive, and they will. They will survive. Whether they're creating social value or not is another conversation, but they will survive. At the top, you have organizations that are too big to fail. There will always be a YMCA. There will always be a Boys and Girls Clubs of America. They will keep getting the money that they're getting that may be diminished in amount, but they will stay in business. The biggest, the historically deepest organizations will survive. But in the middle, there is a competition as never before for resources, and many nonprofits are going to go out of business. And so what you have to ask yourself is, if you are, and most of you are, going to be working in nonprofits that are in the middle, you have to ask yourself, what is our competitive position in, in all of this? Because more and more, um, social funders are, are nonprofit funders are redefining themselves as social investors, and they want a return on, on investment. And the most enlightened ones are not monetizing um, in, uh, return on investment, but they are treating outcomes as return on investments. Um, therefore, if you don't have the ability to understand your outcomes, you are at a competitive disadvantage. Um, and will become more so, as some of the people who were discussed in the, by the first speaker uh, become uh, 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 dominant in the, in the donor universe and in the funders universe, because they are people who expect to see this. And the fact of the matter is, it's not just that you need to have outcomes to convince organizations, um, funders and organizations to invest in you. It's that if you don't have outcome data, you can't manage. You don't know what adjustments to make. You don't want to know what to do more of. You don't know what to do less of. 
you don't know what to do at all. So you probably are not helping the people you think you're helping, or you're not helping them as much as you think you're helping them, or you might actually be doing harm. And if you leave social investors in the dark about whether you are doing harm, or whether you're doing good, social, producing social good, or whether you are um, somewhere in between, they get confused about whom to invest in, and it becomes a matter of luck that you, that you uh, attract revenues, rather than that uh, based upon whether you deserve it. And similarly, you leave your clients confused about whether your, your services are a good place for them to come, because no, who the hell knows? So to me, the issue here is, is the nonprofit sector uh, has to learn how to drive to outcomes, and that means focus, focus, focus. It means serving fewer people until you have the resources to serve more people well. It means serving more sim heterogeneous groups of people until you learn how to help those people before you start working with other kinds of people. Um, and it requires the capacity for relentless self-reflection, which most nonprofit agencies don't have the time for because they're so overworked. Um, and if you can't show that you have these qualities, you aren't going to attract money. And if you can't show that you have these qualities, you shouldn't be able to attract clients because they should be able to go someplace else. I'll give you a quick example. If you are a first-time pregnant mom and nobody does anything to help you in this country, if you're a teenage mom, first-time pregnant, you are likely to give birth to a kid who will be underweight, whom you will physically abuse, who will, um, and who will wind up becoming uh, a high school dropout or a school dropout, likely become a criminal. but there's something that can be done about it. With the Nurse Family Partnership, which is a home visitation program, um, the research is very clear that if you let these nurses into your life in your first trimester and they work with you until the kid is two years old, the, 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 the short-term outcomes for the moms is that the birth weight is normal. Secondly, that the mom um, does not physically abuse the child. Thirdly, that the mom delays a second birth, which means she's under less stress. Fourthly, that the mom will get uh, off welfare and into the workforce. And fifthly, that the mom will not abuse drugs. The long-term outcome, which is where the enormous social value comes in, is that 16 years later, their children are not criminals, they are in school, they're doing well, and they're not drug abusing. Investing in the Nurse Family Partnership provides a meaningful return for every dollar you invest. Then there's Healthy Families America. Healthy Families America claims to do the same thing as the Nurse Family Partnership, except it does it with paraprofessionals, not with nurses. And it doesn't do it with first-time pregnant moms, it does it with all teenage moms. And the research shows that it produces virtually no outcomes whatsoever. Both organizations get hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I want HFA to go out of business for the good, not of Nurse Family Partnership, but for the good of the poor people of America. Because when they get services from Healthy Families America, it's not going to change their lives of the mom, it's not going to change the lives of the kids. If they get the services from Nurse Family Partnership, it will change the lives of both. That is the essence of social investing. I don't want to get into um, uh, uh, definitional arguments. I don't want to get into um, a philosophical discussion. I want to talk about the moral imperative to, especially in times of dwindling resources for nonprofits, there is a moral imperative for you to understand whether you're actually helping people or not. There is a moral imperative for the people who desperately need you to help them. Whether it saves society or money or not, I'm less interested in. I want to know that people are living better lives. You have the potential to help them live better lives, but not if you don't. 
manage to outcomes. And if you don't measure, you can't manage. If you can't manage, you can't deliver. If you can't deliver, you should go out of business. And I think I'll stop at that. <laughs> Questions? One question. There was a pretty um, extreme examples of these two uh, groups with support for mothers. Now, how do you measure no outcomes? Did you have data? How do you measure what? That there were no outcomes if there was no data collection. Oh, and Healthy Families of America um, submitted, its, uh, d submitted itself to at least one randomized control trial evaluation. And so there were data. target population uh, specifically yeah. around when have they been pushed to serve other kinds of mo mothers and, yeah. and, and how that works? This is a tremendously important thing. I go back to what Kate said at the very beginning about the importance of target population and what I said before about needing to focus. The Nurse Family Partnership works with low-income, first-time pregnant moms and they have this incredible success. By the way, they've been studied in randomized controlled trials at least three major ones, one in, 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 in rural New York State with mostly white uh, moms, one in uh, Memphis, Tennessee with mostly uh, African American moms, and one in Denver, Colorado with mostly Latino moms. Okay, same impacts, all three places. So we know it works. So the, the originator of it, David Bowlby, was very, in, David Olds, was very in, in, influenced by a man named John Bowlby, who was a a pediatrician researcher in England who talks about attachment theory and he's very interested in how moms and children attach to each other. And so David Olds, who's a psychologist, um, designed his program to take place in the life of a young woman, some of them are actually girls, the youngest one was nine years old, um, the first time they get pregnant. Why? Because that is such a turning point moment in a young woman's life that they are more likely to be open to constructive influence than they might be if this is their third or seventh kid. So this works so well for first time pregnant uh, moms that David Olds has had millions of dollars offered to him by funders to say, will expand it to include second or third time pregnant moms because the need is so great. The need is though so great, but the program has never been proven to work with them. And so David Olds has said, no, I won't do it. Dangle the money. I won't do it. I will do what I know changes lives. I won't water down what I do. I won't change what I do just because you want a shortcut to meeting other needs. That is real discipline. That is real integrity. That is real humility. The nonprofit sector is really bad at the notion of humility. Nonprofits overpromise and underdeliver all the time. And the funders force them to overpromise and underdeliver so the funders can look good. It is a dance of death. But the issue of for the, the lesson from the nurse family partnership is be modest, say, we know it works for these folks. You want us to do these folks? Well, first we're gonna to have to do research to see whether we can actually help these folks before we're going to do it. And in the meantime, you might wanna go invest in another organization who have a track record of helping these folks. Is that a response, Steve? Questions? whether there's a difference in importance between focus on target population versus focus on the breadth of services. Because we see a, a lot of wealthy service organizations, and even I have been speaking to their 52 pro various programs, um, and so whether, and, and they're one-stop center so that you can have everything in one place so that people can take better advantage of that. So I'm just, I'm, I'd be interested to hear more about whether that there's a balance between focus and target population for the types of services you do that might be applicable to a broader population. Sure. Which kind of focus is, is the important factor?
Sure. Um, I don't believe in generic preventive services. I've never seen it work. I think preventive services do work, but they're preventive services of certain kinds for certain target populations. So if you say, well, we want to run a one-stop shop where we can attract people, um, and there are going to be a diversity of target populations, I'll say, fine, do it. But make the door really great so they'll walk in. But once they're inside, start triaging. Start figuring out who's who, which target populations there are, and start hooking them up with the appropriate services. And um, including preventive services, educational services. Um, teenagers need one kind of a talk about pregnancy prevention. People come out and coming out of prison don't necessarily need that. They can both walk in the front door, but people coming out of prison need different kinds of conversations than teenagers uh, who are at high risk for getting pregnant, right? So I, uh, I think, and now you say, well, what about things that cut across populations like uh, drug use? Um, I have seen no compelling evidence that one approach to, to, to helping people decide not to use drugs works for all ages. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that it doesn't. You have to talk differently to kids than you do to mature adults. And I've heard no, and, or even for that matter, different ethnic groups. So I think if you're going to run preventive services, you should become very sophisticated about the kinds of folks who you're actually going to have contact with and try very hard to tailor your preventive services in such a way that they are appropriate to the people you're working with and therefore more likely to influence them in the ways you want them to be influenced. One more comment about the uh, um, customer versus uh, client. I want my doctor to know what's good for me medically. I don't want to be empowered to think I know more than my doctor does. If I know more than my doctor does, I'm firing that son of a bitch. <laughs> but I do want the doctor to help me choose among options and to inform me about options. But I want that doctor to feel personally responsible if I make the wrong decision. The doctor can't necessarily stop me from making the wrong decision, but every time a patient of that doctor's makes the wrong decision, that doctor should treat it as a failure, right? That's not how you treat customers. So one of the biggest issues I encounter with the nonprofits that I work with, and I work with a lot of nonprofits, is as a case manager, can I be responsible for the people I work with making bad decisions? And I say yes. You should, every time they make a bad decision, you should ask yourself, did I have the right conversations with them? Did I engage them the right way? Did, is, was there something I should have done that I didn't do? So that next time, maybe I can help two more people not make that wrong decision. If you don't have that sense of personal accountability as a human service provider, you should go out of business. Thanks, David. Thank you.